Hey, everybody. Thank you for downloading episode 161 of We Got This with Mark and Hal. If you are a fan of the show and you haven't given us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts yet, do it. Please. It helps new people find the show. It tells them what you like about it, which I think is really cool. But also, the more reviews we get, the closer we get to more We Got This merch. T-shirts, buttons, hats, branded cars. Who knows what's possible? We're only going to find out when we get those reviews. So do that. But for now, please enjoy this episode of We Got This with Mark and Hal. Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle once and for all. Short form improv or long form improv? That's right. Don't worry, everyone. We got this. Podcasts should have a theme song. Podcasts should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Hey, everybody. We are Hal and Mark, and we are here to do a podcast for you. That's right. Can we get a suggestion of a topic that would fit on this podcast? Oh, I just heard short form versus long form improv. Thank you very much. What is your name? William on Facebook. Great. Thank you, William. We take you now to short form or long form improv in three, two, one. Did you do that when you were, did you do countdowns? We did countdowns, uh, at Disneyland for, at Disney, uh, did. for the improv show there. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to, this is a fun topic. I am very excited about this. Yeah. Um, because this is something that you and I have dedicated much of our lives to. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about short form versus long form improvisation. And for those who don't know, uh, long form improv or short form improvisation is the games that you would see on a show like Whose Line Is It Anyway? Or if you go to see a comedy sports show where it's right. here's the premise of this very game game. Um, and we will play this game and it will be funny. And then we'll move on in about five minutes to the next game. Long form improv is. Uh, was created in the seventies and it is the, the, a long one suggestion at the beginning and you'll go for 45 minutes or an hour or however long. Right. The, it's a little bit more narrative in terms of, right. of, of potentially, not necessarily, it's, but potentially. Absolutely. You could have a, you could have a long form that's one, I, one time I saw Scott Adsit and Dave Pasquazi mm-hmm. who were doing a show. This is, this was early. This is before Thrilling Adventure. Right around when it started, but mm-hmm. before I, I when Adson and Pisquazi were playing in L.A. Yeah, we were, we were doing uh, sketch a sketch. Yeah, with Ben Acker and Annie Savage mm-hmm. and and Jennifer um, at Second City L.A. And then I, as soon as we were done with our rehearsals, which ended at ten on Mondays, I would rush over to the uh, the I.O. West on Hollywood Boulevard to see. Add sit and Pasquazi because it was so good. And they did one that was an, int- it was a 45 minute long scene. And then the mm-hmm. next time I saw it, it was a bunch of quick scenes and they jumped around in time and changed characters. But it was still a long form. It, it was, was still, still one. I think that, that's the big difference is the long form is one suggestion at the top. Um, short form is a suggestion per individual game. I mean, there are more differences than that. But yeah, g- a long form can be a long form doesn't have to be one long narrative. It's like point. building a tent. You start right. with maybe four posts that are all separate, and then over time, as you do more scenes, things intertwine mm-hmm. and they all come together. Generally, that's like when you when you see long form; those are the kind of the things that you, and especially when you're learning it, mm-hmm. and when you see other people that do it. That's that for me is like, oh, I can't wait to. Do this puzzle of mm-hmm. we're doing all these d- different scenes, and then organically we're going to figure out a way to make them all. Uh, th- they're all going to intertwine. It could be a simple callback. It could be the characters from scene A and scene C are right. related to each other. Like you just don't somehow don't they're know. all connected into one world. Yes, um, I think we should start with this one. For those, uh, should we work on the assumption that? We, that a lot of our listeners are not improvisers. Yes. We live in a world where all of our friends are improvisers. Yes. Or many of them. Right. Um, but we will, we will work on this. Uh, we will, we will approach this episode from a, if you don't, if you are not an improviser and don't, because basically in my mind, it always seems like improv looks like magic when you watch it on stage. Sure. If you don't know the magic trick. Especially a long form because, uh, for example, there's, and we'll get to this in a minute. There's a long form structure called the Herald that is the most famous long form structure, uh, that 
when you watch a Herald performed, you're not being told everything that is going through the improvisers' minds. They have more information about the magic trick than you do. Meaning, you, what you see is a, looks like a seamless play. They know what you were saying before. Okay, you go out, you do beat one, beat two, beat three, then you play this kind of thing, then you're gonna, uh, bring these characters back. And there's, there's a lot of internal stuff that uh, anybody who's doing a quality Herald has been trained in how to get to these things. But, right. um, I wanna start and I wanna begin by looking back. Go, uh, g- sort of give a very brief history for those who don't know, um, and this is going to be very brief and I might get some details wrong. I apologize. We, Helen and I, we were like, we don't need research for this one. We've <laughs> been doing this for a long time. Um, but here's the, the very briefest version. Uh, in the forties, uh, a woman named Viola Spolin worked at a place called Hull House in Chicago and she invented these short games, uh, that were designed to stretch the imaginations of the kids who were working, uh, or who were living and, uh, part of Hull House. It was a orphanage, I believe, or something similar to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but she created these games for kids to break them out of their shells. Uh, that was Viola Spolin. And she wrote a book, uh, along with her son, Paul Sills, uh, with his help, realizing that these games, uh, while great for children to get out of their shells, could also be great as acting exercises for actors who are trying to find truth and grounding within a scene. So she wrote this book, Improvisation for the Theater, the Improv Bible, um, and her son, Paul Sills, took all of these games uh, to uh, and started a theater company called the Compass Players in 1955. Yes, that's at the University of Chicago right. with Severn Darden, mm-hmm. um, Avery Schreiber, I think, yeah. might have been part of that group, uh, Barbara Harris. So, yeah, so I'm not sure who was all in Compass and who Mina was Kolb Mina was, Kolb was there as well. Um, Severn Darden, the original, like if you like John Belushi and Chris Farley and all the crazy guys that have come out of the improv world, uh, and we'll talk about some of the people yeah. that have come out of Friends the improv and world. Schreiber. Uh, Burns and, uh, Burns and Shrive, yeah. Uh, Severn Darden to me is, he was the original lunatic. On, um, on one of, I think it was Barbara Harris's first day at Second City, mm-hmm. she walked in and said, where am I supposed to go? Is this my first day? And he said, great, I'm going to duct tape you to this lamppost. And he just duct taped her to a lamppost. <laughs> like, he was the original <laughs> lunatic. He was great. But anyway, so they started this company in 1955 and then uh, rechristened it the Second City mm-hmm. in 1959. And this is sort of seen as the birth of improvisation. At the time, the Second City, uh, their system and still their system to the day, to this day is they would use the improvisational games to create sketch comedy. And you would watch a two act show that was comedy sketches. And then you would, if you stuck around late, you could watch them improvise live. And that was, uh, that be, would become their next review show that they did. Yes. Um, and that's, it, I mean, I know that's how it's been in all of my time seeing Second City shows. So this went on for a while, and then in, uh, I guess, late 60s, early 70s, uh, a man named Del Close came around, and Del Close was the first one to say, why don't we just make the improvisation the show, uh, instead of, uh, instead of using these games and improv exercises to write the show, why don't we use improv itself, let it be the show, wrote a book called Truth and Comedy with Sharna Halpern, um, and Kim Howard Johnson, and Kim Howard Johnson, yes, um, and, And also in this time birthed the Herald, which is the first real long form improv structure. Right. Um, So he split off from Second City and started the Improv Olympic, uh, which is now known as IO because the The Olympic Olympic Committee (laughs) sued the comedy nerds. Yes. Um, So, yeah. So that was the first big split around this same time. uh, Theater sports and comedy sports began, which was uh, started up in Canada. Right. That was uh, Keith Johnstone Mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, was theater sports and then uh, comedy sports. And their their approach was uh, or comedy sports approach was let's take uh, the short games and really make games out of them. So a game that went from, okay, this game is you have to touch everything in your environment. It's a game to teach you about where. Right. Um, Comedy sports said, why don't we create some really fun audience friendly games? And they played clean. They didn't allow swearing in their shows so they could keep it to a really wide open uh, audience uh, rather than a nightclub audience. Yeah. And uh, that sort of birthed the short-form comedy movement. There have been permutations since. 
Um, there's UCB now, UCB, which began as an IO team that got popular, created a television show and then opened their theater in New York City. So that sort of brought, um, improv to New York. Right. And they're all not brought. I mean, there was Chicago City Limits. This is a real, like, I'm trying to do this as fast as humanly possible. Again, the stylistic differences are more in how the things are played. But that is basically the timeline. And and everyone now knows that improv is everywhere. Yeah, and I, I would say in a, I would say that in did another, I get med- did, I, did I please correct? You're close enough. Right. By the way, there's a there's a very interesting book called The Compass. If you want to read about the mm-hmm. early days of the Compass players and what was happening at University of Chicago through maybe like the mid '60s, as mm-hmm. the second city like went to Broadway for the first time, and Barbara Harris became the first right. breakout star, and then there were the, moments where it popped. Yeah, your second wave with uh, Alan Alda and Alan Arkin, and like the people who have been through that that you might not. Mm-hmm think of as improvisers first they came through and learned this method and it informed everything that they did so if there is a not a stand-up comedian necessarily but if there's a comedy actor that you love um he or she probably came through an improv school at some point M- more likely than not uh, but what i wanted to say about a big distinction between short form and long form might be how you get the suggestion so w- for long form there are a lot of different devices that sort of kick off the line of dominoes that you're that you're knocking down as you play through a long mm-hmm. form and try and get them to crisscross and make sure that the line sort of stays unbroken in mm-hmm. some way. Like we're continuing to do scenes, whether we play fast or slow. There are different sort of devices that we use to to separate it. But the general idea is all these scenes are happening. I remember um when Jennifer and I first started dating, she was part of the Wednesday night forecast. Mm-hmm. Which was four improv groups. That's right. The last of which was a group of teachers called the Teachers Lounge. Mm-hmm. The third group was called the group, and that was like the cool hot group. That's right, baby. At Second City, and that was you yep. and Jen, mm-hmm. Bobby Kesselman. It was a great team. Um, oh my gosh, Masioka. Mike, Mike Hughes, <laughs> Masioka. Yeah, Masioka, famous from Heroes. Um, geez, who who else am Jen I? Jen Kane. Yes, uh, Jeff um, Schmaltz. Yeah. I mean, we can carry Clifford Rosowski. David Rosowski was the teacher who David is Rizowski, a yes. legend of Second City. Yes. Um, but I remember the, the, we, you would always try different forms for a while. And at that time you would, you'd get an, a, a suggestion, whatever it was, like a word. And then you'd start going and you would spin out and play each other's characters and constantly switch characters. Mm-hmm. And then another time it was based on how the entrances happened. Well, this so isn't, this isn't flashbacks. about, you mentioned getting the suggestion. Those right. are more ways of playing within the. Sure, sure, sure. Um, um but let's talk, let's talk about. Again, this is so hard for you and I, I because it's we're lot. like it's like a bent hose, and we've been spent so much of our life doing this. Let's let's take a quick moment and really define the distinction between a long. If you are going, let me describe going to a short form show, and then you describe going to a long form show. How's that? Um, okay. If I'm going to go to a short form show, here's what I can expect, and I will use a comedy sports show as an example of this. Comedy sports makes it about competition, friendly competition. There's no real prizes or anything. It's just right. for fun. Yeah. Um, and it's by audience applause. So there's a lot more of that interaction. So I go in and I sit down and a host will come out and say, here's what we're doing. We're going to do a comedy show for you. Here is a team of comedians, uh, improvisers. Here is a team of improvisers. This first team, we're going to call them blue and red. Blue team is going to get up and they're going to do a game called, uh, dubbing where two people speak in gibberish and the other two people, um, say what lines they are saying in this scene, like a, like in a foreign language movie. And then they play that game and it's hilarious. Then they go to the other team and they say, okay, now this team is going to play a game called, uh, called bending sitting standing kneeling where they do a scene where at any point someone has to be bending someone has to be sitting someone has to be standing someone has to be kneeling and there's a host that guides you through this whole process and says here is the game of this funny thing that you're about to see and they play a few games back and forth there's probably a finale game and then that's that's how the show basically runs there's usually a musician shout out to all of the great musicians who uh, play improv shows because that is not an easy task. Michael Pollock was the best ever, and he was ours at Second City. Yes, Andrew Melton, who Andrew I Melton worked is with amazing. for years at, at I.O. West. Um, Jonathan Dinerstein. Jonathan Dinerstein. Comes to um, the of improv. The, I'll tell you who's the, the best right now that I love. Please. Becky Ward. 
Becky Ward oh. playing for Chick Spear, which is a single violin yeah. that is running an into, through an entire. I mean, she's so gifted show. as a yeah. musician. And anyway, a great that person. was uh, and a super skilled chef. Yeah, she's. Uh, uh, look, we all her. love Becky Ward. Yes. Um, so that is the uh, that would be a trip to see a short form improv show. Yes. Uh, long form, I think you can expect less audience participation. You are there to see something presented to you, and you are generally asked for a piece of information at the top, and then you will see the players in general uh, try to create a foundation and and throw out as many pieces of information as possible that they can grab onto and use for scenes. So uh, one uh, popular version might be the Armando, where – Somebody suggests ice cream and then somebody comes out with the sole purpose of doing a monologue. They're going to do an improvise. They're going to tell you a true story with as many details as possible about something related to ice cream. And then when they're done, the players will come out and they'll do a series of scenes inspired by the story. They they may not and often don't necessarily uh, reenact moments from the story, but they use that as a as a jumping off point. And then from there, the next scene might be totally unrelated. It might be – uh, something emotional. It could be a single word. It could be. It could be something drawn from exactly. that previous scene or from the monologue at the beginning. Yeah, but it really is like looking at a stained glass w- window up close, where you see there's a blue piece of glass, and then they're putting in a yellow piece of glass, and then a green and a red, and they don't really seem to have uh, much relationship to one another. But over the course of that show, you're moved further and further away from those pieces of glass being put down until at the end you see, Oh my goodness, mm-hmm. this has been a pastoral scene all along. Yeah. And I didn't even realize it. How did they do that? That, that to me is like really good long form or it's a single scene with two characters where you get to see their relationship explored over time. And the beautiful thing about it is th- the things that you discover about those people and watching the the two or three or however many improvisers discover those things together, that, that's the real magic there. I think mm-hmm. that, that sh- short form, it's really – you're amazed at how clever people are. That's yeah. being clever and funny and fast on your feet. Not mm-hmm. that you don't need those skills to be in long form and not that short form players don't have to have good scene skills. But you're more reliant on – like it came up with something real quick that's real funny. Mm-hmm. I've got to make you laugh. Long form, it can pay off later. You're really just trying sure, to – Sure, someone mentions the prom in the first scene and never mentions it again until you see the prom 45 minutes later. Right. Where every character has converged. Right. Which looks like magic. You go, oh my god, how did everyone remember the prom? Well, if you know the magic trick, you know that if someone mentions an event in the first scene – then everyone can kind of go, that's a good indicator of, Hey, let's, why don't we end? Why don't let we let that be our finale? And yeah. that's one of those things that just kind of sticks in your head. Um, so let's talk about the pros and cons of it. I'm trying to break. This is hard. I'm trying to break this it's hard to break apart it down. because this is hard to break down, right? Because it's, it, it's very, very dense. It is. Um, I want to hear about your, let, before we talk about breaking it down. All right. Yeah. You're right. Let's just, cause we're, this is becoming, this is becoming class. a classroom lecture. <laughs> that is not what this show is. Right. I want to hear the, I'll tell you the first time I ever really came into improv, Im- improvisation. Mm-hmm. I was in high school mm-hmm. and whose line is it anyway, which was a popular mm-hmm. British show long before Drew Carey. Uh, made an Americanized version of it. And they even tried to do one, I think, with, uh, uh, the original, uh, guest, the original host, rather, whose n- name's Clive Anderson. Um, but I would watch that show when it started airing on Comedy Central and I thought it was brilliant. I, they, they were all short form games. Mm-hmm. It was guys like Ryan Styles and Colin Mockery and Ron West, yeah. uh, Greg Proops and, uh, Mike McShane. Mike McShane. Uh, th- those were just the American people. Mm-hmm. On the show, it was just a. They had uh, Stephen Fry on once. It was it was just brilliant. And I thought bit of a sausage fest. It was a bit of a sausage <laughs> fest. There were a few women. The women who were there were great. Josie Long, Josie Long. Uh, but I just thought like this is what I want to do. So mm-hmm. me and a group of friends would just start practicing. We play the game our uh, games of ourselves. We did not know any of the quote unquote rules of improv, um, but we would any time. 
somebody would give us a chance to to play games in front of people, we would do it. We would try and bring people in and mm-hmm. and so by the time I got to college and I found out there was an improv troupe there, I was like, that's what I have to do. I got to get into that troupe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was really where I learned a little bit more of the rules. And then it was just reading books and, and that eventually I came out here where I got more training. All I mean, I've done Groundling, Second City, IO West. Um, I've sort of been all over the place and learned all those things. But that was seeing it on television, those short form games and – seeing how clever they were and how it just wasn't like anything that I had really seen or been exposed to. And I was drawn to it immediately. Mm-hmm. How about you? Um, I was almost the exact same story. <laughs> I loved <laughs> whose line is it anyway, when I was in high school and um, we actually, our high school had a pretty robust drama group right. uh, and we started doing improv shows and we would divide into teams before the show. And we started basically doing what were uh, comedy sports, shows because one of our uh classmates had gone to like comedy sports summer camp and just brought it back and was like hey i'm just gonna steal all of this and we're just gonna do it we're like great (laughs) um so yeah it feels like a great introduction to it it's very it's it short form is easy to bite off right um and then i yeah and then so i i wasn't allowed to improvise in college though uh or be in a in like any sort of college improv group because I was at a conservatory and they didn't want us doing any outside work. Uh, and even okay. that or, or training outside of, they had a very specific regimented system that they did. And actually our entire first year of school was improv. So whereas I'd been playing the whose line is it anyway games in high school, as soon as I got to college, freshman year was all Viola Spolin. It was all those that original 1940 whatever book. Uh, improvisation for the theater. All of our games were directly from that. Um, and because we were using it as exercises for acting, we weren't, the, the end goal was not an improv show. Um, but from that, I got really even further into the idea of this Spolin based improv, uh, which was not about, you know, the, like I said before, the games, began as these simple games and then comedy sports kind of made them into these wackier, right. more audience friendly fun games. Um, but I, one summer when I was in college, I went and studied with Paul Sills, who is, um, Viola Spolin's son who helped him, helped her write the book. And it right. was, it was so fun to, uh, witness how Paul Sills felt about the state of improv at this time. Let me guess. Cause he this was about like 2000. It. Uh, yeah. Oh, he did not. Yeah. <laughs> it's a game. Quit writing jokes. Just play the dang game. Oh, it's so easy. <laughs> One time I had a class where, uh, the teacher came, the teacher had been having a rough day. Mm-hmm. And at a certain, this is like level two at mm-hmm. Second City. And they started going, we're playing children's games by children's rules. Like, we don't know at that point. You're still figuring out. Yeah, level two. Every- You've been improvising for eight weeks, two in, months. In that system and even like learning. You know, I learned stuff. But by the time I came to L.A., I had been improvising for like five or six years. Mm-hmm. I had so – I did not really know. I knew that you weren't supposed to say no mm-hmm. and I knew you weren't supposed to ask questions. I didn't really understand why mm-hmm. and I did not know – that I guess I just felt like the whole purpose is to be funny. And the truth is that by doing it well and by paying attention and, and, you know, the, the funny stuff will come, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to have to wait long for it. But I, I, the place I learned that was groundlings of all places, Yeah, but but, you know, in like 2000, groundlings is a great, uh, we forgot, I didn't mention them at the top. Groundlings was another one of the offshoots, but it, uh, Will Ferrell, Sherry O'Terry, Lee Herman, Lorraine Newman, like, some of the great, some of the all time greats came out of that theater. Yeah, absolutely. Kristen Wiig. Um, but uh, you know, like the, the, the good thing about most cities is that the first two levels or so of, of improv classes mm-hmm. are all the same. You are learning a foundation. Yeah. The foundation for short form is the same as, as long form. All of those games that you see uh, on a stage at, at, uh, at, um, comedy sports, those are all skill based games. When you play that gibberish mm-hmm. game, it's really, you're listening, you know, Mark speaking in gibberish. It's his job to try to communicate 
his intention right. and what he's trying to say. But it's, it's not also, just say funny lines. Right. And it's my job to actually listen and pay attention. Mm-hmm. And I think where that game, you know, when you start out though, you're like, well, what's the funny thing right. that he could say? Uh, you just don't know. You learn those things over time. Uh, I don't even remember where I was going with this story. Oh, I don't either. But we're springboarding, which is another Viola Spolin game. Yeah. All these games are meant to teach skills that you mm-hmm. use later on. And then the people who do comedy sports do it. So, I mean, Gourley was a comedy sports sure. guy, right? Jeremy Carter, Mark McConville. All of the super ego guys came out of comedy sports. Lauren yeah. Pritchard came out of comedy sports. Um, some amazing people. This is going to turn into just us listing everyone we love. It's in like an improv. in memoriam for. Yeah, improv. I know. Suffice to say, most of our friends are wonderful, wonderful improvisers. Yes. Uh, and actually, I'll tell you a quick, uh, Second City story. Please. As far as like our friends, uh, being improvisers. Um, I, and I, 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 apologies to anyone who's heard this story. I've told it in an interview whenever he and I, uh, were, did one together. Um, when I was in college, I went to school in Chicago and second city is in Chicago. Right. And when I was in school, I used to go down and watch that third act. Remember I mentioned the third act. It would, there would be the sketch show and then the third act would be where they would improvise. Yeah, they do their set. Right. I would go see the, the show sometimes because that costs money. Right. I would go see the improv set a lot because that was free. Right. Right. Because sometimes it started at like one in the morning sure. for their late show. So I was down there a lot at right. Second City. And when I was there, the show, it was Mick Napier was directing, who's one of the all time greats, wrote uh, a great book about improv. Um, and the players there were my first show that I saw. It was, uh, Paradigm Lost. And I saw, uh, Scott Adsit, who is amazing and one of the all time greats. Yeah. Um, Kevin Dorf. Head, former head writer for Conan, uh, another brilliant improviser. Jim Zulovic, God rest his soul, wound up teaching in, uh, Los Angeles. I got to work with him. Like, this is the point that I'm making. Oh, and, um, uh, Tina Fey and Rachel Dratch. Right. And, uh, Jenna Jolovitz. So that was the cast. No, Adam McKay. He had already left. At Adam that McKay point. had already left. Okay. Um, but getting to see Tina Fey back in the day. Yeah. Uh, was like, that was one of those things. I knew I wanted to devote a good hefty chunk of my life to it when I started going to see these shows at second city. Um, and it, so I would, went for four years and when I was around junior, senior year, this guy comes in and starts doing shows in there. I guess he'd come over from the ETC stage. Right. Um, there was a uh, rich Tallarico had come over and Craig Kakowski. <laughs> and I used to go watch Craig Kakowski improvise. And he is, if you never get a chance to see Craig Kakowski improvise, then I am sorry for you. Um, he's brilliant. And I was a huge fan. In fact, I saw him at, uh, the Chicago Film Critics Awards. I was there accepting award for DePaul University. Right. And, um, I, there, there was a bunch of movie stars there. And I saw a table that had all of the Second City people. And my first interaction ever with Craig Kakowski was I walked up to the Second City table and I went, Oh my God, you, you guys are the cast of Second City. And they're like, yeah. Uh, it's like, I'm a huge fan of you guys. I've been watching, I've been coming to Second City shows for years. I love you guys. And, uh, Kikowski, uh, looks at me and goes, thanks. Why are you bothering with us? There's like movie stars here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, forget those stars, man. And then they were like, here, sit down. And I shot the breeze with them and I've loved all of them ever since. But that was such, I don't even think Craig knows how Im- impactful that moment was. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it was a really, really great moment. And now that he's like somebody you could call anytime. Yeah, we were actually going to do this episode with him. I know. Um, but then, and we, then were, we just got excited about we doing got it. excited about doing it, and we were like, uh, we "We'll do it again with him, and he'll tell us what no, we we'll did wrong." We'll do something else with him. And actually, Craig My did. Uh, Craig used to direct um, our improv group that we had back in the day, and put Hal yeah. and I through the most brutal improv drill. Still to this day, it's the most brutal drill I ever went through. Do you remember this? It was a series of the three or four se- scenes yeah. um, where we were different characters each time. And when he clapped, we had to move from one to two, then two to three, and then back to two, and then back right. to one. But we didn't like, know what they were. The first yes. the first round was do a scene. Great. Yeah. Do a totally different scene. Great. Do a totally different scene. Uh, yeah. And then every time he clapped, we had to go back to one of the previous scenes and we had to instantly know which scene we were back in. I, you know what? I'm glad we're doing this one without him only because I would just want him to talk the entire time Mm -hmm. because not only is he one of the best improvisers on the planet, but he is a 
one of the best uh, improvisational teachers and directors on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I would just be like, well, why? (laughs) We did this. Do you remember we had a – Why should I say anything about this? We did a panel at a Comic-Con. Yes. And uh, and it was an all-about improv panel, and it was just you and I sitting there going, oh, that's a great question. Craig? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now the groundlings get to speak. Like the Shakespeare groundlings, not right. the LA groundlings. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't, what, what is the weirdest, I'm going to tell you the weirdest improv game that I ever played. Okay. It was a show that I directed in college. We had the broken compass players. That was the Syracuse University improv show. Well, it's a, it's clever. It's, it's cute. You know, it's a good throwback. I had it's a our, good, it's a good, it's a good, uh, throwback homage. I got the, um, I didn't the, mean to boo that. That was, that's actually pretty. Thank fun. you. But c- compared to all the improv troop names out there. Oh man. We'll get, we'll play that game in a second. Oh my goodness. Uh, but w- we did a game where at the end we go, all right, we're going to play. Uh, there are a lot of improv shows out there and they're all a lot of fun, but we like to incorporate danger into our shows. Mm-hmm. So what we have here is a bucket of water. We bring out a giant bucket of water. And we are going to have a two-person scene. There will be a third person, their head submerged in that bucket. And they are going to be in that bucket until they can no longer breathe, at which point they will start waving their hand, and one of us has to find a reason to leave, and we have to tag that person in. Mm-hmm. So then the the person – this is beyond the stage description now – the the gimmick is the person who's wet has to come in and justify why they look like that. Right. But the, our version of it, the last person was my roommate, Aaron Jerizal, who hit a straw under her hair and would stay in the bucket. And the last two people would ignore her until, <laughs> until oh, she just went geez. limp. I tried to incorporate sketches. They were terrible because they uh-huh. were all my idea, including <laughs> that one. That's a pretty funny bit, though. That one it worked. It was funny. Um, I was it was okay. The other stuff was terrible. I barely. I like. I don't remember. One of them was like the narcoleptic Olympics, where mm-hmm. everybody's just asleep. I was like, this is because you know when you're, you're when you come up with any idea you come up with in your early twenties is the best idea you've ever had. Oh sure, like, this is gonna be hilarious. And every <laughs> night I was like, I don't know what's wrong with this audience. Ugh. They just don't get this. Why don't they understand me? Yeah. Um, it's like they don't like comedy. So that game, yeah. uh, is, I, I've, I've improvised professionally doing short form improv shows. Um, I mean, not just like atmospheric sort of character ad libby no, things, but shows. specific improv short form game shows. Right. Uh, at two different theme parks, uh, at Disneyland and at Knott's. Uh, and at Knott's Berry Farm for Knott's Scary Farm for their Halloween, we did a show called Hacks. Uh, Frank Macy will put it together. One of the greatest short form improv people I've ever met in my life. Okay. Um, definitely the best short form improv host I've ever met. Right. Uh, and it was, uh, and I could name the whole cast, but it's all people that I, it's all the super ego guys and you know, that. Yeah. We all did this show and we would end it with that, uh, water bucket game every right. time. Uh, not every show. But it always sucked when we, cause it was cold. It was an outdoor thing. Yeah. Uh, I know it's Southern California, but still late October and you're like, ah, oh, I gotta go dunk my head in a bucket of water out. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Disneyland version we used to ride out. It was, was my favorite entrance. We used to ride out to the show from backstage, from our dressing rooms backstage. Yeah. We would ride through the park with, um, bicycles. I, yeah. That had, that had little buttons on them that made them sound like motorcycles. Uh, and we would ride them up onto the stage and we would do these short form improv shows. Duh. The Department of Untapped Hilarity. Can you tell when that show was named? <laughs> I remember, I remember going to see that show. Yeah. But I, I don't think, I don't think you were in the show that No, I, I came saw. in at the tail end of the run. That show ran yeah. for six years at Disneyland. I came in at the end of it. A California adventure, right? Mm hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so let's talk now that we've, now that we've just riffed and. I love and, that we both have the same worst game though. Yeah, it's, it's the, the same. It's your head in the water. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the worst. I mean, there are games that are bad because they're boring or like, right. not, not boring, but some games just don't work. You know what I mean? Yes. And you um, don't want to be the second person in the bucket. You certainly right. don't want to be the third or fourth. Yeah. Oh no, we did it. We were round. We were each in the bucket multiple times. Whoa. Yeah. So it was, for us, it was like, 
you'd come in, you'd go back out, you'd come in. You, oh, we would do three or four entrances each. So we would each wind up with all of each other's germs because it was <laughs> – the three heads went into that bucket multiple times. Yikes. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a nightmare. Um, so let's get – now that we've just reminisced for a while. Right. Let's get back to what is – what are the criteria that we're going to use to decide – Short form or long form. Cause I think they each have their pros and cons. If I may, um, just yeah. to offer up the biggest pro for each of them, uh, short form improv is more accessible. Long form improv is more magical. Would you agree with that? As yes. from, an, from an audience who doesn't know improv's perspective. Now, the flip side of that is, I think, with the, with it being more magical, uh, for a long form show, it also can fail a lot more often. And I don't want to call anyone out, but I've seen a lot of, like when people are training, you see, you know, right. we're all learning, you know? Yes. It's like watching, you go and you watch Second City and Adsit and, uh, Pasquese or these other groups that we love. Right. Um, or so, you know, Ask Hat at UCB, some of these big, like big shows. And it's like watching professional basketball. Yes. In our, you know, when you're in school, it's like, it's like watching the ninth and 10th grade team sometimes. <laughs> yeah. The people on the bench. Yeah. Which is fine. Everybody's learning. I've They're in the done process. The, so many of those shows. Yeah. I've done, oh, I have, I have failed, failed, failed. Failed, failed, failed. But that's sort on of part many of the, improv stages. That's part of the fun of it. Sure, that's the game. You come up, you're like, oh man, we lost that game. Yeah, and it's t- like you have to learn to throw the 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 best part of 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 improvising is also one of the hardest parts, mm-hmm. which is that it's fleeting. It's, yeah, which is great when you have a rough time when you know when you fail. Um, it gives you something to learn from it, which is which is great. But the other thing is that show's over. You're not doing that show again. You right. can't. No. But also when you have a great show and you feel great. Never going to happen again. It's never going to happen again. Yeah. You're just going to do another show. It's going to be different. You can have tons of greatest shows ever yeah. that are all completely different from one another, which is also – maybe that's also something that's that's great about it. And short form to me is disposable with indisposable because if you have a show with, with 10 games mm-hmm. and game two doesn't go well, game three is right around the corner. Yeah. Game- and you can also make if, – if, if the audience knows that a game did not go well – then you can milk that. The host can milk that later on. You know what I mean? Yes. If it's appropriate. Um, but that's the thing. It's so, you know, it's all so like just in the moment, you, you know it in the moment. You know what I mean? It's like what they say about pornography. Like, you know, I can't you describe it. it, but I know it when I see it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, with, with long form, you do have that thing. Sometimes you get stuck in a scene that is not working. Yeah. And or you're in a scene where nobody bails you out. Oh, the worst. Nobody edits, and you're like, you find. So you know, the the more you do it, the more you realize, hey, we're at an edit point. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope somebody comes in and edits us. Yeah, there are certain sentences you hear that are basically, da 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 da. You know what I mean? And yes. then if the scene, and if nobody changes the scene using an edit, another technique, the you know. Walking across in front of the stage or clapping or whatever your team or group uses for edits. Yeah. If somebody doesn't do it, it's hell. Do you remember, uh, oh, we no. used to back in the day that what is now the underground, the, the comedy underground mm-hmm. in Santa Monica was the West Side Eclectic. It was the oh, West yeah. Side Eclectic. It's West Side Comedy, right? Isn't it? The West Side Comedy Underground or, so, or like something like that. But we hosted a show there on mm-hmm. Sundays. It was our group, Shiner, mm-hmm. Shiner Sundays. We would always have another group. Uh, headline. Mm-hmm. And we had, um, 313, which the, the lineup they were going with at the time was Keegan, Keegan Michael Key, Mark Evan Jackson, Andy Cobb, and Josh Naima Funk. Mm-hmm. They had a great set for the seven people we were able to bring into the I theater. Know. Man, we had but, seven people in an audience watching, uh, the actual president of the United States' anger translator. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> The, like the five, I mean, they were just such a great group. Yeah, and they were put on impeccable. A fantastic show, and they got to the end, and it's the responsibility of the person working the lights at an improv show is they are they have a very important job mm-hmm. because they have to call the show and pull it out. Unless the director is sitting right next to them telling them when to do that, mm-hmm. it's up to them. And the they were having such a good set 
that the person working the lights was like spellbound by the work they were doing. So they got to the end and the lights didn't go out. And then you could tell they were expecting the lights to go out. So they go back and do another scene. They find another great closing. Again, the lights don't go out. <laughs> Third time around, they do another scene. They find another great closing and then immediately go into, thank you, everybody. We are the 313. Like, yep. they had to call their own out. But the fact they were able to find it over and over again. That's just good. incredible. So I feel like our decision in this ultimately. Right. Boy, it feels weird. Like, because, I mean, the. You're choosing between your kids. Well, the conceit of this show is that <laughs> we settle the pointless debates. Right. And this is something that's so a part of both of our lives that it's not a pointless debate to us. But it's a pointless thing to debate. It is a pointless that, thing to in debate. In that it is entirely subjective. Right. And we're making it objective. And that's right. really what we do. That's right. We care about a lot of the things we talk about. It's just doesn't oh, I feel don't. personal. You um, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it feels like it may come down to this. Okay. Is – at least this is what it comes down to for me. The magic, the whole point of improv is the magic of it, whether it's as a player or as an audience member. So for me, because the magic, there's more magic in a long form show, I may have laughed harder at, I, and I guarantee I've probably laughed harder at short form shows. Um, because there's, it's so much funny packed into every moment. Hold on. Um, I you saw you come I, to a decision. We can't come to a decision yet. We've been going for like 40 minutes. But we haven't taken a break. Before you finish your thought. Wait, hold, let me. All right. I got to have that whole thought again. <laughs> Before we come to a final decision, because I feel like we're close, mm -hmm. let's take a quick break. Let everybody hear about some of the other shows on Max Fun. I think that's a great idea. All right. Can I get a suggestion for another podcast I should listen to? My name is Amanda, and I love Schmanners. Hi, I'm Susie, and I love We Got This. Schmanners is everything your mama wanted to teach you, but you never wanted to learn. We Got This is two really good friends debating the most inconsequential of topics, and yet making it sound like the most important thing of the day. Why I'm becoming a Max Fun donor is I enjoy the content that is already there. I want to have access to what else I could learn. You have such amazing podcasts. You have so many that cover so many different topics. Oh, I just want to praise Maximum Fun to the, to the skies. These are listeners just like you, and they support We Got This and Schmanners with a Max Fun membership. The 2018 Max Fun Drive is April 2nd through 13th, and if you want to support your favorite shows too, it's the best time to sign up or upgrade your membership. Just tune in starting April 2nd, and we'll give you all the details. Hello, I'm Ross Blotcher. And I'm Carrie Poppy. We're hosts of MaximumFun.org's Ono, Ross, and Carrie. We wanted to tell you the good news that our podcast is now weekly. Yes, weekly. On Ono, Ross, and Carrie, we don't make extraordinary claims. We investigate them. We go undercover with fringe religious groups, investigate paranormal claims, and participate in pseudoscientific medical treatments, and then report our findings to you. In a time where alternative facts reign supreme, we cut through murky spin to give you the straight skinny on topics like UFOs, the anti-vaccination movement, Scientology, and even apocalyptic churches. We're even undercover for some very exciting investigations right now. Well, not right now, right now. That's Ono, Ross, and Carrie with new episodes every week at MaximumFun.org. We show up so you don't have to. All right. Great suggestions. Like great those. suggestions. Those are really good. And we're back. All right. Here's what it comes down to for me. Okay. Um, I have laughed harder at short form improv shows. There are more jokes packed into each scene. Everybody is on the same page immediately. So you don't have to worry about the awkwardness of finding it there. It's easier as an audience member. It's a much easier thing to watch. It's more palatable. But for me, the magic I think of an improv show is in that not knowing that sort of stepping out into the abyss and the audience is on a journey with you. There are more emotions that you get to play with. Right. It's more dangerous. Uh, yeah. It's way more dangerous to do a long form show. So that said, do the benefits of a great on the edge, uh, dangerous long form show that goes beautifully well, do the benefits of that outweigh, 
a terrible, terrible long form show because a short form show, eh, they're all going to be pretty good. They're going to be, they're going to be pretty good to, Hey, that was really good. A long form show can go from holy cow, that was terrible to literally that was life changing. I'm going to devote my life to improv now. I think, um, you know, it's interesting you say that. I've seen terrible short form shows. Certainly, if you're at a point where you're doing comedy sports, mm-hmm. you are better than most. I guess because I've only I've mostly seen comedy. You've sports got a higher sports. batting average, right? Of yeah. course, but you know from doing those shows, especially mm-hmm. when you start out doing short form, that it does not go particularly well. <laughs> you are not as funny as you think you are, yeah. and until you give up I and start getting on board with we and all, you know. Everything that comes along, all the lessons you learn and continue to learn as you improvise over the course of your life. Mm-hmm. I, I do – you're going to have terrible shows about – I went to a long-form show once in Philly. I was so excited. It was my first time seeing long-form improvisation. Mm-hmm. I had read uh, Truth in Comedy. I was so excited to learn – like I really wanted to learn how to do a Harold. Uh, like long-form just was this – this mystery behind a curtain to me. I like, I'd never even seen it. I just heard it described and I thought this is going to be amazing to watch. And I saw a group come out and do an hour plus of improv that was not really connecting with the audience. Let's put it that way. I feel like that horn that just honked behind you was it bleeping you and what you wanted to say. Yeah, about so it was going show. through my brain, <laughs> but it was really rough. And then they stopped and they were like, all right, we're going to take a brief intermission. And I left yeah. and I was crestfallen. Oh. So I get what you're saying. That yeah, was like, see the first long forms that I saw were, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's just you. Can you fly higher is the highest high. Also better than the, the, you know, is it, if the lowest low of long form is, is beneath the lowest low of short form. I think so. Is the highest high also. I think so. I feel like I remember, I don't remember short form stuff. Mm -hmm. I just remember that people are funny. Like I would watch Lauren Pritchard improvise anything if Mm -hmm. it was five seconds long or five hours long. Mm -hmm. She is hilarious Mm -hmm. like just so talented and great at both and i just there's something about long form to me i I hate to say it feels pure because it doesn't i don't think it's i I don't want to take away the games are hidden i do not want to take away from short form yeah there are all sorts of tricks Mm -hmm. Um, because long form is just a string of games like short form, in a way, long form is a string of games like short form, but they're all A, connected, and B, you're not telling the audience what the game is. Right. If you and I come into a scene and I take off a hat, and then you take off a hat, and then I take off another hat, and you take off another hat. We didn't, nobody, no host came out and said, right. we're going to do the hat game now. We just started doing this thing. But you remember that because it was a scene we did in Chicago. It was a scene we did in a long form show. And we were going to see Mark Evan Jackson, who did not speak until the very end of the scene, because mm-hmm. he was so so, like, again, Mark Evan Jackson, was Adson, also was Jackson? brilliant. No, it was Jackson. And you came in and established, like, well, sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. You took your hat off. I took my hat off. You took another hat off. And then I was like, oh, the game yeah. The game here is how many hats are we going to take off? What are the sizes going to be? Right. How big is the hat that Mark is wearing? Uh, Jackson. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we knew that he had on a hat as well. Because, right. Uh, and these, and that's, the, that's what I mean by, like, you find – you find games in a long form rather than are given a game yes. in a short form. And I think, man, I, I really, I don't know that I always do it, but I want to live my life at ones and tens rather than sixes and fours. Right. Yes. You know of what course. I mean? That, that tracks for you. <laughs> and I do too. I'm not saying I want to live a life of fives. Right. But I do like the inherent danger mm-hmm. of long form a lot. Uh, that's more enjoyable to me. Yeah. Than, than performing short form, which I also enjoy. And I think as an audience member, I enjoy seeing long form more because of the, ma- because it's a magic trick that can be hilarious. And you it's, just don't. It's a little bit more like. <laughs> It's a little bit more of picking a number in roulette right. when you're uh, watching a long form show than picking a color in roulette if you're watching a short form show. Right. It is a gamble. And it's, it's interesting to see the forms that people mm-hmm. come up with and how they do, you know, when we did Shiner, 
Craig had us do something similar to the JTS Brown. Mm-hmm. Was that wasn't that the there name was of that a, form? Oh, there's they all have hilarious names. Right. There's Laronde, JTS Brown, the Herald. Like they're all of these different long form improv structures have uh, great names. Yes, um, but we would do like you can start with character monologues. Mm-hmm. You can start with short scenes. You can start with a group game where everybody is making a machine. You know, like there are just so many ways yeah. to do those uh, openings, quote unquote, that give you all your hand. You know, all you're doing is creating a bunch of rungs on like a monkey bar that people can go across. And you don't mm-hmm. know how they're going to do it. They could take it two at a time, one at a time. They can go forward a little bit, then back. But ultimately, everybody's going to yeah. wind up on the other side of the monkey bar. That's such a terrible analogy. Look, I was going to – I was willing to go with it. I was going to yes and you. I will say I enjoy improvising with you. Uh, the two people with whom I think I have the greatest chemistry improvising are you and my wife. Hey, I love that. Because I love I can, improvising with you. I, well, I, the reason why I love improvising with you in particular is I know you're going to uh, take care of me. <laughs> Ditto, pal. Not that, not that I don't trust. It's not even right. a trust thing. It's just I know that Mark figures out. Like we did this once. We talked about this once in a panel that it's like building a house together. Mm-hmm. And you – I just like tossing a bunch of crazy bricks around and then you build like a beautiful house out of it. Yeah, but you got to have funny bricks. Right. There you go. There you That's go. good. Like, again, it is funny. Like in an improv group, uh, everybody fills a function. Yes. And the functions are all different. Like some improv group needs – some improv groups need this guy, this guy and this girl, this girl and this person. You know what I mean? Like you need a person who keeps it grounded. You need a person who's always uh, great with uh, big characters. You need uh, – you know what I mean? Like yeah. that – like and you, you figure out what your group needs. Can I tell you – I want to play this game just because I want to shout them up because I think they're amazing. Okay. Um, I want to know the best improv show currently. I'll, I'll start. This is okay. because I've seen your favorite, your current favorite. I want to give a shout out to my favorite. My favorite is Chick Spear. They're playing in Los Angeles right now. They're about to close, but they run every summer. They are five women, um, all brilliant, five in the cast, a rotation of like, uh, seven or so. All friends that we've mentioned throughout this show, so I'm not going to name drop again. But it is a five, a full on five act improvised Shakespeare play complete with sonnets at the end of every scene, not sonnets, uh, couplets at the end of every scene. And, um, a live violinist, Becky Ward is their musician and she, she sometimes she'll enter, sometimes she'll stay off to the side. Uh, but to have, I've done so many improv shows with a piano. To have an improv show where it is a violin that is providing the music. And they spend about eight months of the year studying Shakespeare plays. And then they run for a couple of months. So it is, it is the best put together and best executed improv show right now. I love it. And these are, they're closing for the season, but go see Shakespeare, all female improvised Shakespeare. They're playing at, um, they're, they're doing a show at, uh, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Awesome. Um, I, geez, I, so certainly Spontanea Nation, it's not a live improv show necessarily. I mean, it is sometimes, but sure. I, I think that that show is so much fun to listen to and it's a very interesting experiment. So it's really kind of taking it to a Nichols and May when they would release albums mm-hmm. of just it, like they would have to improvise through scenes with maybe they had sound effects once in a while, but mostly it's just the two of them. So to have mm-hmm. four people together. It's always a rush to do it, but also just the mixing and matching of different personalities and listening to it. It's a really fun study in different improv- improvisational styles coming together to build a story. Yeah. Uh, on stage, I want to give a shout out to Craig and Carla at Orange Tuxedo. Oh, yeah. They're, they are currently touring around. Carla is a great improviser and a great teacher if and you, director of If you want to listen to a great imp- – I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I just got go excited. Ahead. She has a great improv podcast where she brings improvisers on. Yeah. And this is – we have glossed the surface of improv in this improv yak. Yeah, improv yak. If you want to dig, dig, dig in, yeah. check out Carla Kukowski's uh, improv yak. But it's they're amazing. they're just a pleasure to watch improvise yeah. and work together. You know, it's a, a married couple. Sometimes – a couple together can be more difficult because it's – you know each other's tough – you maybe mm-hmm. don't want to get in – like mix it in with each other. But the two of them are fearless improvisers, yeah. both highly skilled 
and and different from one another, and their shows are really fun to watch. So those are a couple of L.A. fantastic yeah. improv and shows. And Orange Tuxedo's tours. touring. So find them. Yeah. And if you're in Oregon, go see Shakespeare. Um, this topic... Uh, Did we settle this? We have not settled this I didn't even say yet. people of the world. I don't even think we've done this part. I think that we... I think we know, though. I think we know. People yeah. of the world, uh, we're going to go with the magic. I would rather be on a trapeze 100 feet in the air. Uh, that's just rather where I'd be. Not that... Not that short form is easy. Uh, there's certainly risks in it as well, but that feeling of going out with zero net, you do not know that, that the scene you're in, you don't know whether it's going to be two minutes or a half an hour. You just don't know until you're out there doing it. And it's exhilarating to perform. It's also exhilarating to watch. And again, this is not a qualifier. We are here saying because we are here to settle things that long form is the best over short form. However, you got to learn short form. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, Michael Jordan wouldn't be a good basketball player if he didn't know how to dribble and pass and shoot. And there are different drills for all of those. And that's part of what short form does both in a classroom setting and in a rehearsal setting and on stage is it helps you hone skills that you can use in long form in any other form of acting and in everyday life. Just take an improv class. That's part of the work that. That, uh, Mark Emma Jackson and his, and his wife Beth have done with the Detroit Creativity Project. If you're not familiar with DCP, it's dcpimprov.com uh, or DCP yeah. Improv on Twitter. I think it might be, uh, Detroit Creativity Just look up Project. Detroit Creativity Project look and it you'll up. find they're, it. They're, they're using. And give them your money. Yes. Because they're amazing and they're doing great things. I donate multiple times a year. I encourage you to do the same. Yeah. But it really is a skill. Taking an improv class will help you. Whether you want to be an improviser or not, there's mm-hmm. something that you can learn and a way that you will grow as a person. And that's, it's, we're in a, like a golden age. Imagine if we had been, you know, when we were 16 years old, if improv were as prevalent as it is now. Man. Now they're like communities in Austin and New Orleans and, uh, you know, New York's got a vibrant scene they have for years, but almost any major city, dad's garage in Atlanta, mm-hmm. there are, Improv communities all over now. And Wherever you live, there is a show happening tonight. Yes. Fine. Go. 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 Get involved. Join yeah. the community. Short or long form. Go. Yes. William, thank you for suggesting this topic. This topic is closed, but there are many more. So please reach out to us on Twitter at We Got This Tweets or check out the Maximum Fun subreddit. Or you can email us at we got this podcast at gmail.com or go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash we got this podcast. Here's why you want to do that. Number one, when we have live shows, which we have and will continue to, we're going to put information about it there. So you'll always know where our next live show is if you go to that group. Second, we release bonus content there. Ooh. There's bonus content sitting on there right now from Dragon Con uh, that you can listen to only if you join that group. So go do it. Thank you to producer Ken Plume, researcher Kate McManus, graphic designer Uri Kelman, and QA engineer Jen Alba. And thanks, of course, to our musicians Jonathan Dinerstein and Mike Furman for our score and theme song, respectively. And thanks to you, our listeners, um, not only for listening to the show and giving us an opportunity to talk about a thing that we love, uh, but also for sustaining the show uh, by supporting MaximumFun.org. And uh, and we we promise we are good stewards of your hard-earned dollars. We are using it for gear, and we are using it to travel and put shows on in as many cities as we can. We thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts for your time, for your attention, for your help, uh, and for just being you. Uh, sorry this episode wasn't super funny. We just kind of got in, dove in deep. That's all yeah, right. We I sure love did. it. Sometimes it's a deep dive. You know what? Thanks for being with us for the deep dive. For yeah. Hal Lublin, I'm Mark Gagliardi. For Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin. And don't worry, everybody. We, we got, got this. this. We got this. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported.